first of all, I want to ask you, we were lucky enough to just be able to visit with the social entrepreneurs who were identified and who've been helped along the way by the Skoll Foundation, by the World Bank's International Finance Corporation, and by Avina, a foundation that uh, covers all of Latin America. Uh, didn't you think the social entrepreneurs were pretty fantastic? Now, I get to introduce an entrepreneur in his own right. You know Peter Gabriel for his music. You know that music has always been connected to social change. You know Peter Gabriel for his commitment to human rights. You know Peter Gabriel for founding Witness, one of the most extraordinary human rights organizations. And you now know Peter Gabriel for having founded also the elders, along with his friend Richard Branson and others. And so, Peter, would you come up and introduce your pal, Annie Lennox? Thank you very much. Um, Annie has been making great music for a long time. She's an extraordinary singer. But I've been meeting her, even though she's now a neighbor, more often at the uh, at Mandela's 46664 concerts, which she's been uh, a regular. And I guess there's probably, I don't know, 50, 70, 100 artists that have been going to these concerts. Um, they've been performed, particularly in South Africa, but in other places. But really, there's only one who has really taken on the issue, taken on HIV AIDS in the way that Annie has. And last time we were there, she told the story of a young girl, uh, which I don't know if she will during this, with, um, and the impact that the retro, uh, antiretroviral drugs had had. And the whole place was in tears, uh, including me. Uh, gives me great pleasure to introduce a great artist uh, and a great person. Please welcome Annie Lennox. I'm not sure. Thank you. 
so inspirational to me, but they are experts in their field, and I am a lay person. I, I, I'm very fascinated by health issues and uh, these kind of things, but I'm not an expert. And I think that my role as a, a musician and as a communicator can be to translate some of the messages that you experts in these fields might want to get across to a broader audience. And that's why I think there is tremendous value in music making with a purpose. In any case, um, thank you. Thank you. I have to say that I feel that the society that we live in is extremely dumbed down. And I've been terribly frustrated by that. Because, you know, when you have the benefit of tremendous systems of communication via internet, via uh, television, press, radio, these things, surely we must use these vehicles for transformation, for global transformation, because we have the power to do that. Why on earth do we need to get obsessed with celebrity culture when there's so much more that we can do in the world? I had an opportunity in 2003 to take part in a concert that was uh, given on behalf of 46664 Foundation, Nelson Mandela's HIV AIDS Foundation. Peter was there, and Bono, and Bob Geldof, and Yusuf Nadur, and the most wonderful artists came, and it was a celebration. It was the first time that I witnessed, Peter, I witnessed you performing Biko. And I can tell you that that was one of the most powerful moments of my, my life. And I'll never forget that. And that was another reason to think, wow, song delivers message. Song with content. So we were invited the next day to go to Robben Island, the place of incarceration for Nelson Mandela for almost 27 years. Mandela stood in front of his former prison cell in an exercise yard in Robben Island. The artists were to one side, and the global press were standing in front of him, a battery of cameras, journalists, media. And he said one thing that almost blew me off my chair. He said, the HIV AIDS pandemic is a genocide. And I took a breath, because when Mandela speaks, you know that he means what he says. This is a man, if you mention his name to anyone in the globe, they all, they all say, wow, I'd love to meet that man. I'd love to show him my uh, respect. And when Mandela says that an HIV AIDS pandemic is a genocide, you have to really pay attention. And I was so ashamed, you know, because I'd understood that I hadn't got the message. And I thought about the media and my own comfortable life, our comfortable existences in the West, and the very fact that this is not in the front pages of magazines and newspapers really, really made me almost want to hang my head in shame. How can it be that a Holocaust can be going on? A Holocaust? Men, women, children, millions. At that time, five years ago, 17 million people had died because of AIDS-related causes around the world. And now I think the figure is uh, over 26. And we all know the statistics. They are horrendous. Why is there such a silence about this? I do not understand. In any case, I have left South Africa determined to commit myself to speaking up about HIV and AIDS. And it's been a journey of five years. I've been trying to figure out how can I be most effective. I have performed at 466 concerts. I have spoken at UNICEF lunches. I have given interviews on television and radio. I have shown up wherever I get an appropriate opportunity. And I think I have to be careful about that because the value of us, I mean, I'm seen as a celebrity, you know, and I, I don't like the phrase. I don't like that label, but in the, any case, I think there is value to celebrity when people are interested to listen to you. But if you don't have the right kind of information, if you don't have the genuine interest and knowledge about these things, you actually can do it a disservice. So I've stuck very closely to HIV and AIDS, and I have to say I'm not an expert, 
But my visits to South Africa and also to Uganda, I was uh, taken to Uganda uh, on behalf of Comic Relief just before we gave the Make Poverty History concert for Live Aid in Hyde Park in London. I spent several days in Uganda filming in the rural districts, filming women who were affected by HIV and AIDS. I saw people who were literally dying like flies around me. And it is something, you cannot put words to this. It changes your life. So I have, this is part of the, my story. I'm sorry, I hope I'm not taking up too much of your time, but um, subsequently I've been to clinics, orphanages, hospices, hospitals, communities, townships, to find out what HIV AIDS looks like, what it feels like, to look it in the eye, to see what it really is all about. And I decided to try to make some small reportage style films, because I don't think people's attention spans are very long these days. I think it's best to keep it short and sweet. To try to convey the, 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 the feeling that you get when you see this thing face to face. To try to translate that into something to do with film. And we're all bombarded by images. We've seen them all. We've seen the skeleton faces and staring eyes of AIDS. We've seen the children with their swollen bellies. And you know, to our shame, we are, we are somehow not oblivious, but somehow protected from it. When you see it face to face, you can't forget it. You can't live without remembering it constantly, at least I can't. So I've made a few short reportage style documentary pieces about aspects of HIV and AIDS. I'm going to continue doing that. I've housed them on a website that I made called Sing, because I have now a campaign called Sing. Sing, I, I say Sing because of the stigma of AIDS where people are so afraid, even when people are dying all around them, even when their family members are dying, their work members are dying, their teachers in the classrooms, the nurses and the doctors themselves are dying, people are still afraid to acknowledge this terrible virus. Um, so I've made some pieces and I'm going to show you something in a minute that I've made. I also wrote a song called Sing and I invited <clears throat> several uh, international female artists to join with me because I hope that it would give me a, a broad platform of exposure. And in a way, it's, it's, my, it's my theme song, Sing. And it's calling for access to mother to child transmission prevention program in every maternity hospital across South Africa. And you know, that would be my ultimate goal, you know, to see access to treatment, access to medication, especially in South Africa, which is a country where people have not responded appropriately to the pandemic. Women and children are the very first victims of what I would say is almost a criminal pandemic. It doesn't need to happen. We can really make a difference. So now I'm going to show you a couple of pieces. Thank you.
all that just gives you an idea of the kind of um, impact that you know a filmic piece can have. And um, Avi Lile actually was an incredibly sweet and special little child. We spent quite a few hours with her. And when we left the hospital, she was actually in the nutrition center of a hospital in the Eastern Cape of South Africa. It was very heartbreaking because when we left, we actually didn't know if she was going to survive or not. And we kept calling the hospital weeks later to see how she was getting on. And she made a recovery. <laughs> So, um, uh, but wait, but wait, I have something very special to show you in a, in a moment. Um, yeah, that was really significant. And if you would like to put the picture up of Avalili when we left the hospital, I mean, this is how she looked. And um, we went back five months later to visit her and to film her again. And this is what she looks like. <laughs> and that's really the message of, of my campaign, um, is that you really can make a significant difference. <laughs> that child is going to school, and this is a child I thought was going to die. And what, what she received was treatment for HIV, proper medical attention, good nutrition, and loving care. Simple. And I would like to see that for every child that is HIV positive. And I'd also like to see that every pregnant woman, and there are one third of pregnant women in South Africa are, as I've said on the, on the piece, are HIV positive. And I would like them to have access to the treatment that may, means that the child does not have to be born with the virus. And in that way, generations of children could survive. And we don't have to have a genocide. Um, just before I go and entertain you on the piano, um, which I've been asked to do, and if anyone would like to leave the room before I start, you're very welcome. <laughs> In any case, the t-shirt that I'm wearing, I think, is extraordinary. I'm going to tell you the story behind this t-shirt. Um, I went to a very fancy dinner. It was, a, it was a little bit more fancy than this. The people were wearing very expensive ball gowns, and they'd come to commemorate Mr. Mandela in George, in the Green Garden State of South Africa. And I was sitting there feeling slightly out of place because I'm not really accustomed to these very, you know, dignified things. And across the, the room, I spotted a man wearing a black T-shirt that says HIV positive. It, this says HIV positive, yeah. And I thought, whoa, that's interesting. Everybody else is in suits and fancy clothes, but this man is wearing this. He looks like the real deal, and I have to go and speak to him. So I went over uh, and introduced myself to this man. His name is Zaki Ahmad, and some of you may well have know, know of Zaki, because he is the mo one of the most incredible activists in the world. He's HIV positive, and he has fought for the rights of fellow South Africans to have access to affordable treatment for many years. In fact, he risked his own life by refusing to take treatment unless it was made affordable. He is the kind of spirit like Mandela. He is a fighter and he's not afraid. He sticks his neck right out. I love this man. And I said, if I'm going to support anybody, it's going to be him. <laughs> I love this initiative of wearing a T-shirt in solidarity with those who are afflicted with HIV AIDS. You don't see the virus, you know? You, I met a man, I have to tell you, that when I was performing at Pop Idol, or Idol Gives Back the other night, I was sitting backstage and a very big, robust, healthy man walked up to me and he said, thank you very much for wearing this t-shirt. I want to tell you that I'm HIV positive myself and so is my wife. No one knows, but we're on treatment and we're really healthy. Isn't that amazing? So, I mean, wouldn't we, shouldn't we all be in solidarity with those who have the virus? Shouldn't we try to alleviate some of the stigma? It's just a virus, for goodness sake. The fact that it's transmitted sexually doesn't need to bring us into such shame. 
in any case, um, you're all s such incredibly successful people and, you know, incredibly kind and philanthropic and giving in all kinds of ways, I'm sure. But I think that is, I'd just like to say one thing before I sit down and entertain you. <laughs> um, human rights, something so fundamental, charity and philanthropy are wonderful that we give, that we recognize the need for giving, that we empathize with our fellow man, those in need. But I feel that ostensibly, we need to change social, economic systems so that people are empowered to help themselves. And if, if you extraordinary people can develop new ways of approaching the kind of insurmountable, as it seems, problems of third world issues, which called so-called third world, the South, the issues of the South, poverty, all, the, all of that, all of the symptoms that come with poverty. If we can think outside the box, there's so much that we can do. I think it's extraordinarily exciting, and I think that this forum really starts to show us that there is a move in a new direction, a hopeful move, a powerful move, a move of the people that's coming to a tipping point. And I very much hope to see uh, these kind of changes taking place in the very, very near future. I believe they can really happen. I don't think it's impossible, given the collective will of people like yourselves. Thank you. Usually when I perform, I have a band, <clears throat> lights, fancy things, you know, um, and then I realize that it's really difficult to pay them constantly. <laughs> they don't come cheap, you know, and it isn't only that, it's like it's very difficult for me to commit to touring around the world constantly because I'm a mother and I have two kids and I don't like leaving them. But I suddenly realized that if I could dare to overcome my own fear of playing the piano and singing at the same time, uh, there could be some value in it. So if you'll just indulge me for a minute, uh, <laughs> hopefully I'll be able to, you know, get through one song at least.
That was a Neil Young song. Yeah. Thank you. He's an oldie, but goldie. Here comes the rain again, falling on my head like a memory, falling on my head. Thank you. Woo. Woo <laughs> okay. The brave paradise put up a parking lot with a pink hotel, a boutique, and a swinging hot spot. Paradise put up a parking lot. Hey, farmer, farmer, put away that DDT. Give me spots on my apples, leave it to the birds and the bees. Up a parking lot. Late last night, I heard a screen door slam. And a big yellow taxi took away my old man. 